Welcome back, guys. We have a very special guest, Amber Theo Harris, who works for SiriusXM. You can catch her this week, SiriusXM Channel 87. They have some great guests coming out. Angelo Hall, James Jones. They have, if you're if you're a fan, if you're a WWE freak like me, they have The Miz coming out also. That's going to be awesome. <laughs> but let's get to the interview with Amber. Amber, thank you so much for joining us. How excited are you for Super Bowl week? I love it. I mean, this is, I hate to count, but I think this is my 12th Super Bowl. Um, so every week, it, every time you get an opportunity to cover the greatest game uh, in the world, it's really a fun week. And I feel very grateful to be in the profession I am and be able to hang out with the media and the players. It's, it's great. Amber, you kind of told us a story and a little bit about yourself. You were in Las Vegas for the Pro Bowl. Uh, you said hi to your three kids from 6 to 11, young kids. You said hi, and then you ditched them right away to come to this podcast. Should we feel Look, honored? Are we concerned about you? I don't know. What's going on, Amber? Look, they know the deal. Because if they complain, I said, do you like those shoes? Do you like this light in the house? Do you like the food? Okay, then let mama go to work, okay? <laughs> no, they're used to it. They were, you know, they were born into this profession. They didn't have a choice. Um, you know, I was traveling around pregnant. Uh, covering baseball, covering football. So I feel like they've always had a traveling mommy, but um, this business is kind of great in the sense that when you're gone, yes, you miss them, but then you're home for really long stretches. So you're not the nine to five, uh, you know, working every single day. So it's nice. I get to spend a lot of quality time with them, but they know between Pro Bowl and Super Bowl week, you know, daddy's in charge, which is not always a great thing. I came home and I said, the only thing that, uh, the only wish that I had asked was that they were alive when I came home from being gone for a week and they were alive, but that was the bare minimum. That was the bare minimum. The house was a wreck. There was no food in the fridge. I think there was McDonald's. So, you know what? You just learn to say, all right, my husband did the best he could, but it's good that I'm home. Hey, that's how it was for me growing up, Amber. Uh, my mom gave us some McDonald's. Are you guys okay? Fine. Time to go to work. You're on your own. Uh, and uh, like you mentioned, you're alive and well. Uh, so I, I kind of I, I like that, Amber, that, you know, you gave them the, the rules, the drills and on your way. You got to learn to let it, everything go. You know, you're like, they'll live. And then and sometimes uh, not being a helicopter parent, I think, is good for them. Like they they learn to do things on their own and um, they definitely probably learn to feed themselves this weekend on their own. So that was good. And <laughs> they now know how to make things on the stove and they're six. Shout out to dad for teaching life lessons. That's what he did, Amber. He taught life <laughs> See, lessons. Don't, don't he showed you, those don't, skills to be self-sufficient. Don't gang up, all you men. Don't gang up. Don't like be the dad crew over there. You guys know your moms, the women in the family do everything. But you guys do oh, do yeah. a good job. You do it. Dads do a good job. They they love their kids. <laughs> no, we, we respect that, Amber. Yeah, 100%. When we were in Philly, I even tw I even put them on, on Instagram. I took a picture and I said, my mom actually did dress me so she said out michael she was like this is the way you need to dress i'm like okay mom whatever you say so hey i'm not gonna fight against my mom my wait, mom's always wait, how right, no old are what. you how old are you Ed, that doesn't matter i'm a mama's boy <laughs> until the day i die <laughs> oh my gosh hey, sounds I like were you raised by mom. a greek mother because it sounds like a greek mom that's what that's what we do that's a mexican <laughs> mother right there it's like yeah, the same thing yeah. almost the same thing same thing but, uh, um, Amber, you were in obviously in Vegas yesterday, and we all know Justin Herbert and the offensive MVP. Just what were some of your takeaways from watching Justin uh, go out on the field and, and kind of play? It didn't take me seeing him in the Pro Bowl to be impressed with um, how strong of a young talent he is. And just seeing him in his second year and seeing the progression from year one to year two, but then as a collective two years to have one of the best first two seasons ever of any uh, young quarterback and to beat Dan Marino's records. And um, it's clear that the Chargers have their future. They have the, the future of the franchise. But now it's a matter of what is it going to take to allow Justin to thrive in that offense. We saw the first year between him and Brandon Staley. Um, we saw the aggressive fourth down calls, the analytics. So it's, I feel like from the national media side, we really got a, an early look of who they're going to be or who they want to be. And it almost worked. And now they're one year away, right? So now we got year two of that combination. And 
how does that progress? Does it progress into being able to make the playoffs and, and what's become a very uh, difficult AFC West? Um, a lot of changes in the within the division, you know, with the Broncos and the Raiders getting a new coach. And um, so I think there's a real opportunity for the Chargers and Justin Herbert. But people forget he's only 22 years old. Joe Burrow is 25. Even though he's in his second year, he's 25 years old because of the Ohio State LSU thing. So those three years of maturity do give you an advantage for sure. And so you have to credit Justin Herbert even more for being so young and accomplishing what he did in just two years in the NFL. Yeah, that's a good point, Amber. You know, the more experience you get, the better you do. Uh, but uh, but I'm curious about the Pro Bowl because when uh, Justin Herbert got his uh, his uh, MVP award, there was a, a rain of booze dropping down. Was it pretty loud down there? It, it was, I mean, you're in the black hole, baby. You're in Vegas. Like, what do you expect? It's a Chargers quarterback getting an award. I mean, Raider Nation was out in full effect yesterday at the Pro Bowl, like the scariest people you've ever seen in your life at the happiest event the NFL puts on. So, of course, they, they're going to boo uh, the MVP of essentially an all-star game. But I interviewed Justin right after the game, and um, that was actually the first time I've interviewed him. And I was really impressed. Just a very nice young man. Um, he seemed very mature, um, but he also seemed young. You know, like you could really see that there was so much room to become more comfortable uh, in who he is and, and more assertive and things like that. He's definitely assertive on the field, but it's also who's around him. You know, is Mike Williams going to come back? Uh, how are they going to use Austin Eckler? Can he stay healthy? Uh, Keenan Allen is older, so they're going to eventually need uh, to replace Keenan Allen if they're, they need, you know, Joe Burrow, I keep going back to this because we're here at the Super Bowl. You know, he has Jamar Chase. He has T. Higgins. He has Tyler. Bort. He has all these young weapons around him. And that's what Justin Herbert is going to need in order to grow uh, long term together. Uh, Amber, thank you, you Amber. Yeah, thank you, say, Amber. You thank you, happy. Amber. Thank you, Amber. Because I've been knocking on this. I've been saying for this kid. Keep on getting them weapons no matter what. It, it doesn't matter if it takes. you got to keep on giving them weapons, especially because he is just one of these guys that can really, like, he just he feels like he can make anybody a star. And I've been telling Gilbert for the last two years, whatever it takes, get this kid weapons. Get him a Jamar Chase or get him a Tyree Killer. Get him something that he can keep on growing with and keep on, uh, and keep on progressing with. So thank you for making my point. But I think that's any young quarterback, right? Like, uh, there's two things they need. They need a young weapon like a Jamar Chase, but they also need an offensive line. Um, and, you know, there was times where the Chargers line played well and there was time where the Chargers line didn't, but they do have a young left tackle that was at the Pro Bowl and Rashawn Slater, right? So they, they have some of the pieces there with the offensive line. But I feel like when you have a young quarterback like that, you can't focus enough on the offensive line in the offseason. Um you know, I look at somebody like a Mac. I feel like in the AFC, there's a changing of the guards. We have all these young quarterbacks, right? And and if you Patrick Mahomes, he he has a a Kelsey and a Tyreek Hill. Um, Mac Jones doesn't have that, so I feel like Mac Jones is maybe even behind Justin Herbert. At least Justin Herbert has some weapons. Mac Jones doesn't have those like you know, receivers that you have to circle and say, we're going to double team them. So I, so I, I would put Justin Herbert and Mac Jones kind of like in a different category than Joe Burrow and Pat Mahomes when we're looking at the future of the AFC right now, because Patrick and Joe have the weapons. Now, clearly Joe Burrow needs an offensive line around him. We saw him in that divisional round get sacked nine times. Uh, and we're going to see what happens in the Super Bowl with Aaron Donald and, and uh, Leonard Floyd and, and, and Von Miller coming after him. So that offensive line is going to get tested again. And and I think the number one move you'll probably see from the Bengals in the offices is to strengthen the offensive line. Going back to what I'm saying about Justin Herbert, you know, you can never pay attention and never bring too much talent in around your young quarterback when it comes to protection. Amber, you mentioned you've, you've been to 12 Super Bowls. You know, it's kind of a strange Super Bowl still, maybe not like last year in Tampa Bay because the whole COVID protocols. We're still kind of in that same kind of weird area. Like today's opening night of media day. And we were talking to Joe Burr at seven in the morning. Like what kind of opening night at seven in the morning? Uh, so it was kind of a little strange, but, you know, the one thing I noticed about, you know, Joe Burrow, people kind of liked the swag. They're always asking about the swag and the, for the personality, the cigars, the turtleneck, the diamond chain, all that. But when you talk to him or I don't know if you got, you've gotten to talk to him, Amber, or when I saw him on that, uh, you know, that fake opening night Zoom press conference. <laughs> fake. He, he, was, yeah, he was very, you know, chill, composed, laid back, poised. And I feel like that's the way he plays on the field is you know, kind of a poised quarterback. But when it's time to kind of get a little, you know, 
show it off a little bit when he wins the big games. He knows how to do that. But I think for the most part, I think people like that confidence. And that's how he's gotten this team in year two, the Bengals to the Super Bowl. Is that something you think is a big deal for that Joe's kind of gotten Cincinnati, the whole city, to buy in into what he's doing? Look, it's very difficult to be drafted to a losing organization. And usually when you're the number one overall pick, the reason why you're going to that city is because they're bad. The team is bad. <laughs> That's why they have the number one overall pick. And so it's really difficult as a young quarterback to come in and change an entire culture within the first two years. I mean, just two years ago, the Cincinnati Bengals only had two wins, right? They have a young coach in Zach Taylor. But one thing that I've noticed about Joe Burrow, it's not even like just his swag. It is the way that he says things, the way that he allows people to phrase things around him. It it he doesn't allow them to be excited just for just for making the playoffs or just for getting a win. He wants to change sort of to that old patriot mentality of we're expected to win. And and once you flip to that mentality that we were supposed to be here, we belong here, we're not just so thankful that we made it, that's when you start to change the culture from the inside out. And I think that's what Joe uh, has offered. I mean, yes, his cool demeanor, um, the fact that he doesn't get rattled when he is sacked nine times, he doesn't cuss out his offensive line or throw a football or, you know, we've even seen Tom Brady do that this year when he was getting hit hard by the Saints. You know, he goes, tells Dennis Allen to, um, you know, go pound sand and, you know, to see the goat do that and Joe Burrow not do that shows you that he's, he's calm and collected, but more so he understands what it takes to be a winner. And he's always been a winner going back throughout college. He's always been a w winner. And so he brings that mentality that we expect to win. We're not just thankful to win. We're not just grateful. Anything less is unacceptable. And so he's changing the Bengals culture. Amber, do you feel like all the pressure is basically right now on the Rams because of all the pieces that they've gotten? They go out, they get Matthew Stafford during the season. You go get Von Miller, you you sign uh, OBJ, you have all these guys. Do you feel like the pressure is a little bit more on them because of everything that uh, surrounds them? And then obviously them being the home uh, the home team basically in uh, in the Super Bowl, being at home? Yeah, they're they're the away team at home. It's true. They, they are the away team, actually, um, but they just happen to be playing at, at home here in the Super Bowl. Um, you know, I think that's a difficult question. I think the pressure is on everybody once you get to the Super Bowl. Once you get to the Super Bowl, you're expecting to win the Super Bowl. And I don't think the, if the Bengals lose, there's going to be a feeling of, oh, well, it's OK. You know, we got so close. Like I as going back to my last answer, they expect to win now. So there is no like, hey, we're just so glad we got there and maybe next year. So I think there's a lot of pressure on the Bengals as well. Um, and I think for the Rams, yeah, this is Sean McVay's second trip there. So, you know, I think he would obviously like to perform much better than they did in, in the first trip to the Super Bowl a couple of years ago. And I think whenever you do go all in and you create this all-star team, that there is more of a focus on you because – you gave up everything. You gave up these draft picks. I mean, look what they gave up for Matt Stafford. Three first-round picks, right, in a third round, I think. And then they lose Jared Goff, too, who was a guy that got them to the Super Bowl. So they gave up so much to get him. They really didn't give up anything for OBJ. They paid him in Bitcoin um, because he was cut. Remember, he was cut by the Browns. So it didn't cost them anything. But, yes, to trade for Von Miller. Um I think there's an expectation. It's kind of like when LeBron went to Miami, right? And they created that dream team. It was like, okay, now if you don't win, then it's a complete failure. But also people know that all-star teams don't always win right away. Just because you get all the parts doesn't mean there's chemistry. Remember, all these parts came in the middle of the season. We've seen different machinations of this Rams team. Who they were at training camp versus the first couple of weeks versus midseason versus the end of the season versus now. And even Matt Stafford's taken different identities throughout those different moments in the season. I mean, just at the end of the season, he was throwing the ball to the other team more than he was throwing touchdowns, right? And then he gets into the playoffs and he's he's throwing, uh, he's throwing playing clean games. Now, if Chikweski Tart catches the ball, it wouldn't have been as clean, but look, we can't go back and look at that in the NFC Championship game. But so I guess what I'm saying is, yeah, maybe you could say there's more pressure because... Les Snead was all in and a win now, whereas the Bengals were obviously trying to win now, but there's many, many years to come for the Bengals. But we all know 
it's hard to get to the Super Bowl. It is hard to get back there. So this idea that like, ah, it's okay if the Bengals lose, oh, it's okay. We'll be back next year. People in this league know it doesn't work like that. I think the Bengals. So if they, so if the Rams win the Super Bowl, is it going to be is the is the movie going to be called One Night in Cabo? Because that's that's literally where this trade went down for Matthew Stafford. So I feel like that's going to be that's going to be the name of their documentary. It will. It'll just be, uh, you know, put it with the rest of the sport, uh, sports folklore, I guess. You know, it's just one of those others. But that's how business goes down all the time in the NFL. That's how these things work between GMs. It's just very few of those stories get out. So it seems very uh, Hollywood-esque. And, of course, with the Rams being in L.A., people made it this big story. But that's, that's kind of how business is done everywhere. Uh, Amber, uh, one more question before uh, Fernando puts you on the spot. But I feel like, you know, this guy doesn't get talked about as much. And... I feel like you probably have some good things to say about him, but Cooper Cup. I feel like every time I watch that guy play, uh, he's he's making a play, he's scoring a touchdown, uh, he's getting a good block. So just watching Cooper Cup for this whole year, the way he, the numbers he put up, I think he got over two thousand yards just total. Uh, it's it, and you should maybe even get the MVP. I doubt it, but uh, it's a more quarterback award. But just watching Cooper Cup play in twenty twenty one, now to twenty twenty two, what did you think about him? So. Cooper Cup has been, like you said, one of the more underreported stories. He's had one of the best seasons ever in NFL history, even better than Jerry Rice. And he, and it's it's mentioned, but it's not – nobody's harped on it. And that's unfortunate. But I think that's also because of who Cooper Cup is. He's just a quiet, stay-to-himself kind of guy. Um, he's not flashy about his touchdowns. Like if OBJ had these same kind of numbers, if it was OBJ instead of Cooper Cup, like everybody would be talking about it. Everybody would know about it. But it's just been quiet, and that's been interesting. It kind of shows you that the NFL gravitates towards the louder kind of players. Um, but in this game, on the football field, Cooper Cup is the, like, make no mistake about it, Lou Anaromo, the defensive coordinator for the Bengals, the number one player he is circling is Cooper Cup. We saw in every level of the playoffs, I remember remember the Bucks game, the last two passes where he just got behind the Bucks defense and just scored, he just torched them. And that's what he can do on any given play. So a lot of people say, oh, should they run the ball? Should they give it to Cam Akers? Should they give it to Sony Michelle? Yeah, because play action is a big part of the game. But if they keep giving it to Cam Akers, uh, I think that's a win for the Bengals because that means they're not giving it to Cooper Cup at that point. So if you just have Matt Stafford come out, start firing, and complete a bunch of passes to Cooper Cup, it's going to be a long day if that's secondary for the Bengals, who's played very well, by the way. One of the more underrated units in the NFL, Mike Hilton and Eli Apple, and I forget who else I'm I'm missing. But um, if, if Cooper Cup can exploit that secondary early, I, I think it's going to be the Rams all the way. So now that you kind of put us in there, I got to ask you, who you got this weekend? You know what? I'm going to go with the Bengals. I'm going to go with the underdog. Ooh. I just think they have heart. I think they have that feeling of lightning in a bottle. I think the explosiveness of Jamar Chase, no matter how much you double team him, you're still going to have Joe Burrow can always come from behind. Um, the one key, though, is going to be running the football early with Joe Mixon, establishing that because that hasn't been the formula. And they've kind of they've gotten behind and had to play from behind and had to throw the football. If they can get an early lead and then establish Joe Mixon and continue to run the football and, and keep the ball out of Matt Stafford's hands, uh, I think that could be the, the formula. And I think Matt Stafford can make mistakes. We, we, we've seen that. Um, so I don't I, I just there's a feeling about the Bengals, I guess, that I like. And I like their defense. I like their front seven a lot. Very underrated defense. It's Very. Before we let you go, Amber, I just wanted to let you know, when you asked me to be on your show, it's funny. We were at the craps table in Vegas, <laughs> Gilbert and I. And I, it's funny because I, uh, I threw the dice and I lost. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to bow out. But then <laughs> luckily, lucky, lucky, I look at my phone. Amber Theo Harris had just followed me on Twitter. She asked me to be on her show. I'm like, wow, I'm the luckiest guy walking out of here. And uh, obviously you had asked me to jump on. It's funny. We went out till like three in the morning that night. You asked me to jump on at like eight. I was like, okay, I have to mentally prepare to jump on this. And I was ready. And then you told me, oh, I accidentally double booked. I'm so sorry. I didn't. I my like, producer it's... did. No, no, your producer. I took yeah. responsibility, I like, but yeah. No, you're good. But I was like, you know what? It's fine. I went back to sleep. And then I asked you, will you jump on with us? You said yes. So this has been awesome. We, I, I appreciate you uh, jumping on with it. But like I said, walking out of Vegas that night, I was the lucky one because 
we were able to uh, get you on the show or ask you to be on the show and, and everything. See, so I appreciate should, that. Next time you should text me, you know, should I, <laughs> should I put red or black? I would have given you my high school number. It could have been like black no, one six. I would have there definitely you helped you out, have you win some money, but no, I'll have you on another time uh, on the show. It would be an honor to have you. What was that number again? Uh, what color, uh, one Amber? Six, black one six. Okay, we got it. Remember, yep. Fernando. High school. You, you have yeah. to hear. You, hey, those are those are the those are the best ones, and those are the bets that are gonna win. But yep. we definitely appreciate Amber. Hey, don't forget to check it out this week. They're gonna be having awesome guests. Channel eighty seven, Sirius XM. They're gonna have everybody, and like I said, I want to do it again, so I'm gonna say it. They're gonna have the Miz, who is <laughs> awesome. So yes. Check I think, it out. Check out the show. I think we have some other wrestlers, and this is how bad I don't know WWE Ooh. that like they're coming on, and I'm like, "Hi, what's your name?" And they're like, "Brian," and I'm like, "Oh, hey, Brian," and I'm talking. And their real name is like the Destroyer, and everybody <laughs> knows them. Hey. And my kids are calling me, and I'm like, <laughs> "Oh, I'm supposed to know who this guy is." If you need an intern for the week, I got you. I can I can whisper <laughs> all the names in your ear. I know all these guys, so I'm definitely all about it. That'd be awesome. <laughs> okay, done. Thank we're you so hired. much, Amber. Thanks for having me, guys. It was fun.